Hi, I'm Teo Nicolakis with Audioholics, and in this episode, we're going to be talking about Anthem's flagship preamp processor, the AVM90. So stay tuned, and I'll be right back. Welcome back. If you haven't done so already, be sure to subscribe to our channel here on YouTube. And if you like this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up. And as always, please be sure to put any comments or questions below. Let's get started. If you've been in the audio or home theater hobby for any amount of time, then you know that Anthem's pre-pros are synonymous with high-end cinema and multi-channel audio. Anthem's products have often been described as being for those who want two-channel audiophile performance in a multi-channel setup. It's a legacy that goes all the way back to 2001 when Anthem was known as Sonic Frontiers with the AVM2, and that pre-pro retailed for $2,799 back in 2001. The Anthem AVM 98K is Anthem's flagship preamp processor and retails for $7,499. The AVM 90 is a product forged through the crucible of the COVID-19 pandemic and the devastating AKM audio chip factory fire in 2020. Those two events eliminated the planned 4K iteration. That's why there's only an 8K version of the AVM90, and it necessitated that Anthem implement a whole new DAC and DAC design into the AVM90. The results, as I'll tell you in more detail, are just spectacular. The AVM 98K comes in the streamlined chassis design that Anthem introduced with their STR integrated. The streamlined chassis is a far cry from the busy front panel of the AVM 50. There's just a single power button, five front panel buttons, and a volume control. That's it. Powering up zone two and controlling zone two inputs are now relegated to the included remote or Anthem's mobile app. You no longer have discrete main and zone two power or control buttons on the chassis front. Rather, a single power button uses colors to tell you what's happening. A blue LED ring tells you that a single zone is turned on, as you can see here. And if you have both the main and zone two powered on, it turns purple. And if you have HDMI CEC enabled, including eARC, then the power button has a red ring when the unit is powered off. The updated chassis brings with it a much larger and sleeker display, and it features the volume in large numbers. I can easily read this display from 18 feet away at my main listening position. I couldn't do that with either my AVM 20, 50, or AVM 60. In the display's corners, you can optionally show the active input, arc room correction status, and audio signal details in a single view. The display is dimmable on a scale of 0 to 100 percent. Let's take a look at the AVM 98K's connectivity options. The AVM 98K sports just about every connection option you'll need in a modern setup. The AVM 98K is a 15.4 channel preamp processor. The maximum speaker configuration then consists of nine bed layer channels, six height channels, and four independent subwoofer outputs. And I'll talk more about the subwoofer outputs in a bit. The channel outputs are fixed not assignable. So for example, if you have uh, two or three rows of seats in your theater and you want to add a second or third set of side surrounds, you can't redirect the front wide outputs or any of the sub outputs or even one of the height pairs to serve as an additional set of side surrounds. I'll also note that you need to configure the bed layer channels heights and subwoofers sequentially. The best example, so you can understand what I'm saying, is the height channels. While you may have front and rear heights, those would be configured as height one and height two. The rear heights, even though you'd think they are height three from an Atmos diagram from a 7.1.6, are only the second pair in that setup because they're active speakers. 
If, however, you do have six height speakers, then the middle set becomes height two and the rear set becomes height three. The same goes for subwoofers. You need to install them and configure them in sequential order. So take note and avoid yourself any such confusion with the physical setup or arc configuration because I've seen that this has caused some end user confusion with posts and forums. Now, the AVM98K sports seven HDMI 2.1 inputs with HDCP 2.3. There are two parallel HDMI 2.1 outputs on the main zone, which as you all know, are ideal for hybrid TV and projector setups or feeding the main zone to another display. There's also an independently switchable HDMI 2.1 output for zone two. Now the main zone's HDMI 1 output supports eARC for simplified and advanced connectivity. Now don't confuse HDMI ARC with Anthem's ARC room correction. eARC is an HDMI standard that allows you to pass two channel stereo all the way up to uncompressed Dolby Atmos and DTSX audio signals at up to 192 kilohertz and 24 bit 37 megabits per second from your TV to the Anthem via a single HDMI connection. Now, I've been testing the eARC functionality on the AVM90 with my Sony OLED with decent success. While HDMI CEC still has its gremlins, as I'm sure you all are aware, um, it's not that bad. And I especially want to take note that if you're using Sony's Bravia core streaming service like I am to stream IMAX enhanced movies, you'll be pleased to note that you do indeed get the DTSX codec coming through via HDMI eARC on the AVM90. Now, there are four pairs of single-ended RCA audio inputs and a dedicated moving magnet phono input. Yes, a phono input is something I don't ever recall as an option on an Anthem Pre-Pro. Certainly not on any unit I've owned, at least going back to the AVM20. You'll find traditional digital connectivity, which includes a pair of SPDIF optical inputs, three Toslink optical inputs, and one Toslink output. The AVM90 lacks any stereo balanced or AES EBU inputs. Anthem dropped those long ago, and you haven't seen them since the AVM50. Every detail or analog input can be assigned to any one of 30 virtual input channels. Now, the AVM90, like all Anthem products, natively integrates with Crestron, Control4, Savant, URC, RTI, Elan, and just about any IP-based remote control system, even something like a Rumi remote on iOS. Now, Anthem's available 30 virtual inputs, just to go back to that for a second, are real game changers. And I, frankly, have a hard time using any preamp or AVR without virtual inputs. Out of the box, the Anthem AVM90 comes pre-configured with virtual M HDMI inputs that correspond to each of its physical inputs, as well as streaming and ARC, uh, et cetera, audio return channel. If you want to rack mount the AVM90 as I've done here, then just note that a rack mount kit has been retooled for the new chassis. It's now smaller than the one that I had for the Anthem AVM60 uh, review unit that I had here. Anthem's AVM90 is special, and I'm sure many of you wanna know What's the difference between the AVM90 and the AVM70? Everything starts with Anthem's choice of a pair of ESS Technologies flagship ES9038 Pro DACs for the main zone. Simply put, the ES9038 Pro is one of the best DACs on the market today. Audio quality is a key differentiator of the AVM90 among any other product in the Anthem lineup. And you may recall that Oppo selected the ES9038 Pro for its universally acclaimed UDP205 universal displayer. Good choice. The ES9038 Pro is a 32-bit 768 kHz eight-channel DAC capable of an impressive 132 dB dynamic range and minus 122 dB total, harmon total harmonic distortion and noise. A DAC's ultimate performance, however, and this is key, is really the sum of its parts. And to maximize the DAC's performance, Anthem updated the voltage regulators for the ES9038 Pro, 
Anthem upgraded the DAC board from a four layer to a six layer board, and Anthem AVM 90's precision resistors are 0.1%, and the AVM 98K has upgraded op amps. So each of these upgrades have really real and audible um, difference in, in the design. So let's focus for a second on another differentiator, and that's the AVM 90's four independent subwoofer outputs. Each of those also have their own dedicated DACs. Anthem chose a pair of ESS Technologies 9038Q2M, which is also a 32-bit 768 kHz stereo DAC for the subwoofer outputs. The AVM90 also uses completely separate DACs for Zone 2. And what's great for all of you Anthem lovers is you can finally play native HDMI input sources switched to Zone 2. So that's another great benefit. So what does all that mean? Is basically that Anthem upgraded the audio circuitry in every reasonable way that would have a realistic audible benefit to the end user of an AVM90. Now, let's talk about another differentiator for the AVM70, and really a first for an Anthem product, and that's four independent subwoofer outputs. This is major. Now, we know from Harman's Todd Welty that four subs in a rectangular room are really the sweet spot to address room modes and ensure smoothest bass consistency across seats. The Anthem AVM 98K, in combination with the latest version of Anthem's Arc Genesis, will calibrate each subwoofer independently for optimal performance. But Anthem didn't stop there. The new version of Arc Genesis with the AVM 90 will automatically and independently calculate the optimal phase of each subwoofer to yield the best transition to the mains. Independent quad subcalibration and automatic phase at this price point are a real game changer. The AVM60 was Anthem's first foray into streaming audio. And really, in my opinion, it wasn't a rousing success. The AVM90, on the other hand, really feels like Anthem has re-envisioned from scratch what a multi-channel pre-pro should be in a streaming world. Apple AirPlay 2, Google Chromecast are standard. Spotify Connect and Bluetooth are also on board. And the fact that Rune is coming means that Anthem has embraced this paradigm shift. And I'll talk about Rune in a bit. For those of you who are familiar with AirPlay or Chromecast or Spotify, you'll be pleased to know that the Anthem comes up instantly on your network when you attempt to use any of these protocols. And of course you have Ethernet and Wi-Fi built into the unit. My iOS and Macs instantly saw the AVM90 as an AirPlay endpoint. I could stream directly to the AVM 98K or group the AVM 98K with other AirPlay speakers or even Apple TVs. Now the same is true with Chromecast devices. Now what's really great that if you're an existing Rune user, the Anthem AVM 98K will show up as both an AirPlay and a Chromecast endpoint. You can then configure the Anthem for one or both protocols to your Rune core. It's a superb solution for mixed protocol environments. Now the strengths, quirks, and limitations of those streaming technologies are also present. For example, Chromecast, it's painfully slow to load music on the Anthem. I also find that the volume steps for Air AirPlay when I'm controlling it with my iOS device they're just a little bit out of whack. They're too far apart. Um, that limitation is eliminated if I group with other AirPlay speakers or obviously you know, I'm using the volume remote. So again, some of the limitations of those technologies are still present. Now, let's talk a little bit about Rune. Rune is just one of my favorite products. Anthem announced that the AVM 98K will be a Rune endpoint. It's coming, it's just not here yet. And let me point you to my Audioholics Live interview with Enno Vandermeer, Rune's CEO, and the Anthem Arc segment Gene Delasala and I did with Blake Alti from Anthem and Scott Noonan from Audio Advice. I mentioned that the AVM 90 is born out of the COVID pandemic and Rune is one of those temporary casualties of those engineering shifts. Uh, in terms of when is Rune coming? 
My best sense is hopefully it'll be coming at the end of this year or perhaps early next year. Uh, and I also want to just take a point to clear up some other confusion that I've read in various forums. I keep hearing, well, I'm waiting for Rune. Wait a minute. While Rune certification is important, it should not present an obstacle from someone considering the AVM90. First, you can connect a Rune core via HDMI, SPDIF, Toslink Optical, or any of one of those other streaming protocols to the AVM90. Yes, there are some limitations, like you do lose that native volume integration and rat lossless streaming via the mobile app. Nevertheless, the absence of Rune certification does not mean you're unable to use Rune itself with the AVM98K today. So I hope that clears it up. What about Arc Genesis? The AVM90 comes with Anthem's heralded Arc Genesis room correction system. I'm gonna be doing a follow-up video here on Arc Genesis because it'll make everything too long and focusing on the benefits of having four independent subwoofer outs. I'm gonna show you that with some measurements seat to seat. What you just need to know right now are a couple of key items. So just three points to talk about with Arc Genesis on the AVM90. First, the AVM90 comes with a completely new and upgraded microphone. What's special about the new microphone is that it's directional. It has a small hole here towards the top of it, and the purpose of the hole is to show the microphone, make the microphone more accurate with high frequencies. This is especially key if you're looking to calibrate speakers behind an acoustically transparent screen where you do experience some loss or issues at the top end. And it also addresses another limitation Longtime ARC users will know, Anthem said, we really don't want you calibrating a five, above five kilohertz because at that point, things become directional. The microphone isn't built to handle that. They've started to address that now with the new mic. So that's a key differentiator with the new microphone. The second key is automated phase adjustment for each sub. This is a separate calibration step that you perform after your measurements are done. Now, I found phase adjustment to be exceptionally good, and I've tested it here with two and four per listen subs, and all I had to do was put the microphone in the main listening position and let it do its magic. But just note, if you do perform two or more independent measurements that have a different main listening position, ARC will not pause or prompt you during the phase measurements to change the microphone location. So what you're gonna to need to do is to pause it manually, and it's not super intuitive when you do that. So that's a current limitation in the software's feature set that I hope Anthem will update in the near future. Finally, I always like to highlight Anthem's Quick Measure. This tool eliminates the need for separate software like REW to perform initial measurements to see the best placement for a speaker or sub and see how its performance is so you can find that optimal location in your room. But what's really great is you can run Quick Measure after you've performed your calibrations and then you can see measurements without ARC and then you can toggle ARC on to see how ARC is actually performing in your room on that speaker. While you can run measurements on each sub with Quick Measure, Quick Measure currently lacks the ability to play all of your subs together and get the measurements with and without ARC. Again, that's another feature that I hope Anthem will update because at the end of the day, that's how you're playing things in your room was with all the subs present and you wanna see ultimately what that frequency response is. So having performed a feature overview, let's get to the real fun. Um, I wanna to talk to you about some listening impressions. Well, I started off my review period with the AVM90 head to head with my Anthem AVM60. I connected both the Anthem AVM90 and the AVM60's XLR outputs to this one Little Bear XLR switcher. I then connected the output to my benchmark AHB2 power amps, which I have configured in dual mono. And I fed those to my Revel Ultima 2 salons. I then set my Rune Nucleus server to feed my OPPO UDP205, and then I had the SPDIF and HDMI connections fed in parallel to both pre-pros. 
Of course, they were level matched with the precision that when you switched the one little bear, there was no indication that you had even done the switch. They were perfectly level matched. Now, I did testing with someone switching for me between the 60 and 90, and I didn't know which was which. And then I did switching at various occasions for friends and family, all with ARC turned off on both units. Well, I'll tell you, the AVM 90s, sonic superiority was easy to distinguish on pretty much any song that I threw at it. I played Steely Dan's Gaucho, Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon, Alicia Keys, Copeland's Appalachian Spring, you name it. The AVM 90 was head and shoulders better than the AVM 60 with a crazy sense of nothingness with silent areas in the soundstage just being totally black. There was a larger image presented, a more focused, refined, and three-dimensional and detailed image of vocalists and instruments. So in particular, when I was listening to concerts and there was the sound of the audience, instead of this slight haze that you would hear in the air around, it was just transparent. So forget me, how about the other folks? Well they too not only heard the audible differences between the 60 and 90, but described it in much the same way. So do you have an AVM 60 and are debating on an upgrade? That's an easy answer. I didn't stop there. I took my Focal Clear MGs for a spin between the two anthems as well. And I don't normally spend time testing the headphone output on a pre-pro. Well, I will tell you, the difference between the two anthems wasn't even close. The AVM 90s headphone output annihilated the performance of the AVM 60. I also decided to put the AVM 9060 against the Oppo UDP 205's headphone output for reference. And what I'll tell you is that I actually found the performance between the AVM 90 and the Oppo to be far more similar, very similar actually, with the Oppo having a slightly warmer presentation. And I suggest that the way I describe the Anthem is perhaps just a bit more analytical. Um, since I've had the AVM 60, um, but not an AVM 70 in here for direct comparison, I can only convey to you that the engineering upgrades, the refinements of the AVM 90, they're real, they're audible, and they're enticing. Whether it's enough for you to make a difference between the 70 to the 90, I can't say you'll have to make that determination for yourself, but it's the real deal. I uncovered some usability quirks when using the AVM 90. Thankfully, Anthem's latest firmware update addressed many of those, including the unit's internal fan kicking on. So I strongly suggest if you do purchase an AVM 90 to make sure that you're running the latest stable firmware. But there are a couple of items that I do want to bring to your attention. I did find HDMI CEC to be problematic at times. I guess who doesn't? We, we've all got issues with it. But if you do not need HDMI CEC, I suggest turning it off. For custom installers, just a particular note because I found an issue with the AVM 90's triggers and a specific use case that I'm referring to pertains to zone two. So what I did is I took uh, trigger one and I set it to turn on every time I turned on the main zone, but then I set trigger two to turn on only when specific inputs were on. And what I found is Let's say that I had uh, the OPPO playing and I had the Zone 2 trigger to the OPPO if HDMI 2 was on. If I powered off Zone 2 and the last active input was that HDMI input 2 and then powered on the main zone, even though Zone 2 was off, because that was the last active zone in Zone 2 when power on the main, it would actually turn on the trigger in zone two as well. It's as though there's a piece of code that might be missing, letting the Anthem know that zone two is actually off and you shouldn't activate any of those triggers. So if you are um, designing a trigger network, it's just something you might wanna pay special attention to. 
If you're looking at the competitive landscape with the AVM90, there's really only one other pre-pro under $8,000, and that would be the Marantz AV10. The AV10 is a very competent, well-built, well-designed uh, pre-pro. It's also a 15.4 channel. Gene Dallasala had it on the bench and did his measurements and impressions in his review, and it came out with some exceptional results. What you're going to see with the AVM90 in part two of my review is how exceptional exceptional a performer both on the bench and listening test the AVM90 is. I do expect there to be some sonic differences as there typically are between uh, the Anthem and the Marantz lineup. So depending on what your preferences are, you're probably going to prefer one or the other. I also want to highlight a couple of other functional differences. Number one, the Anthem is really a protocol agnostic unit. You have support for AirPlay 2, Chromecast, and it's Rune ready, which means you're going to be able to stream high res right from a Rune media server, whereas that's not necessarily the case with the AVM10. The AVM10 is putting all of its eggs within the AirPlay 2 ecosystem basket. There's no support for Chromecast, and it's only a Rune tested as opposed to a Rune ready device, which really means that you're sending your signal over airplay um, from Rune. The other element that I want to notice from a UI point of view is the AVM90 is just simple, straightforward, and the usability is a joy. You have a major differentiator with the larger display, which for some people is going to make a big difference. Um, and I'll also note just a few other things. Both are 15.4 processors. You do have Oro 3D support on the AVM10, whereas that is not the case with the Anthem AVM90, and as I mentioned before, that's really just a non-issue whatsoever. Once you start getting uh, for other features, you're making a significant leap in price. You either have to go to a Storm Audio, or as I have here, my review uh, unit of the Focal Astral, so that's $20,000, or uh, going up to a Trinov. So now you're talking into the $25,000, $30,000 range. So when it comes to a product like the AVM90, while it is expensive, it's sort of unique in its sweet spot. It offers tremendous performance and bang for the buck and really high value. And um, hopefully you'll stay tuned and hear a little bit more from the bench tests and also from my listening impressions in part two of my Anthem AVM90 review. So until then, keep listening. Don't forget our Patreon channel at patreon.com slash audioholics. We appreciate your support. You'll get direct access to us, you can ask questions, and you can even suggest topics for future programs.